first overview of this is light. For there, there are medicinal chemists, there are pharmacognosis. They they do do search, they do explore novel compounds. But uh, in traditional ways, what was going on? Suppose if I am a medicinal chemist, which I am. So what we used to do in previous time, we used to synthesize because anyhow, if I have a uh, um, M farm and I have PhD in PhD work and I had designed some scheme and I, I will continue my life around that scheme. I don't want to explore any other things. I just know how to prepare. Let's say, for example, I know how to prepare quinazolines. People used to prepare all their life around quinazolines, different derivatives. And they were, let me tell you, they were, and most of them are, till today, they are designing it blindly. They are designing it blindly. Let me tell you more precisely, they were designing it very blindly. They had no scientific rational, like, why should this be? They had just some uh, some blind rationals, blind guess that it should be active, but there was no no rational behind the 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 um, behind the act, uh, be, being the activity of of that compound which they were synthesizing. In the same way for for uh, natural product chemists, they used to synthesize net, uh, sorry they used to extract molecules from the plants. And they had no idea whether actually this would be active or not. They have no rational. So this is one. And of this, you know, this is time consuming, consuming part of that drug discovery. It involves money. It involves, uh, it involves human personals. It involves, you know, it involves chemicals. It involves time. It involves cost and the most important thing what what uh, to me is if we are synthesizing blindly if we are exploring blindly we are we are wasting our resources we are wasting chemicals and those chemicals which are going into the environment they are spoiling destroying our environment that is that is one of the most thing which hurts to me so after this process the next step comes preclinical trials. The preclinical trial is the preclinical trial is activities carrying out different pharmacological, biological activities, microbial arc activities. Then comes clinical trials in human. Preclinical is whatever you are doing identifying toxicity, identifying its activity, all those comes under the umbrella of preclinical trials. Then when, when this is... ...safe and this is effective, then scientists move on to clinical trials to he, he, into humans and when the four cl clinical stages are successful it becomes a drug and approved drug. there are all other processes for approval that is different topic but into this process this these steps are very time consuming and expensive as well and the result is very low. The success rate is very low. Now let me compare it with the rational or modern drug discovery approaches. The modern drug discovery approach starts from, it just doesn't start from, from synthesizing or exploring natural products. It starts from target identification. It starts from identifying the disease, identifying the pathophysiology behind it, identifying the, the stages, and then which enzyme you need to block. Yanil, you need to identify your target. 
Target can be any enzyme, it can be any protein, receptor, all those things. By the way, receptors, enzymes, they all are proteins. So here first, you have to identify the mechanism of disease and then the target. Yeah. Once target is identified, then we need to identify the, the lead. We need to identify what chemical compounds, what new chemical compounds or existing chemical compounds can inhibit this target. This is lead identification. This can be through chemical synthesis. This can be through uh, screening existing natural compounds or through, uh, through Me Too drugs or repurposing. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk around repurposing of the drugs for existing drugs, of course. Once that lead is identified, then we optimize the lead. We make some changes and again go back to, to, to the inhibition of the target. Once all these things are happening in silico, inside the computers, when your lead is optimized in various ways, you have, uh, you, uh, you, you can optimize it being a, an oral drug, you can optimize it by activity, you can optimize it by by the least toxicity having so when you are optimizing it after that you synthesize it and go to the uh, to the real with that real in vitro or in vivo studies then comes pre preclinical trials and the process is like, like then the process is like the uh, the traditional discovery processes but here all these steps they Come under the umbrella of CAD. The advantages are it's time and cost saving. When you are you you are uh, saving your time and cost, you are saving environment as well. You are not unnecessarily synthesizing a lot of hell of compounds, million of compounds, and wasting alcohol, wasting all the chemicals. So this is one thing, and the the success rate is very high. I will show you some data and 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 you guys will be will be amazed how successful CAD is. And actually, still now people are not realizing the uh, the worth of the CAD. So when all this here is consuming uh, is uh, is cost saving and time saving, the success rate of achieving a drug is is quite high. I'm not saying very high, but is quite high in comparison to the traditional drug discovery approaches. Ah, now, let's see what types of CAD are. CAD is barely classified into two parts. One is structure-based drug discovery. One is ligand-based drug discovery. Structure-based drug discovery is, uh, is applied when you know about the structure, when you have uh, some some knowledge about the structure, which is further, it can be an unknown structure or it can be divided into unknown structure. For there are two approaches. For the known structure, you have already the structure. You can uh, most of you guys may be knowing it. The known structures can be found on PDB websites. There are there are few websites like RCSP. You can these are basically protein data banks where. Uh, the proteins are saved for for various types of of, of uh, receptors, enzymes, all the targets. So, in structure uh, based drug design, when the structure that structure through PDB, we can download it and then process it, repair it, and then you can further carry on your your CAD steps on that. The next type is when there is unknown structure, when the structure is not well known. Actually what happens, maybe we do not have exact structure for, for, for some, maybe for some bacteria or something, but we have some related structures. We consider it as template, the related structure. And on that template, we build up our protein. That is called homology modeling. And if we model that protein and which is homolog, other types. So 
So in SPD, we will uh, go in more details, but to have an overview, SBDD is one when there is a known structure and other when you are preparing the structure, we are, when you are preparing the protein. The next type is LBDD. LBDD stands for ligand-based ligand -based drug discovery approaches. In the ligand-based drug discovery approaches, there are two types. One is QSAR-based approach. Another one is shape screening. Can I request, guys, please uh, do, not, do not draw anything on the screen. Please take care. I know there are grown-up guys. Okay. So, in the ligand-based drug discovery approaches, there are two types of approach. One is QSAR-based and another one is shape screening-based. Shape screening-based, you, you can call it pharmacophore mapping also, pharmacophore studies as well. So, let's see QSAR first. Uh, let me tell you about QSAR. Many people are... Uh, not well aware about QSAR, the, the, the definitions in the book are not, books are not very, uh, very clear to make the people understand about QSAR. Let me start from SAR. Being from the pharma background, everybody knows what is SAR, structure activity relationship. We are teaching the students, we, we, we are learning by, uh, for our own self. Uh, the people who are writing are really giving hard time. Uh, anyway. QSAR. Actually, I was talking that everybody knows SAR. In the books, in the literature, it has been written that if there is a there is a basic pharmacophore, and if you are in this electronegative group it can improve the activity or it can decrease the activity. That's what we are, we, uh, we are learning in SAR, right? But in SAR, we are telling that this electronegative group or this, this electron withdrawing group on some position can increase or decrease the activity. But how much? How much it increases or it, de it decreases the activity? There is no data about that. Nobody is talk. Nobody was talking in last decade about that. So when we quantify the effect of that electron withdrawing substituent or electron uh, uh, donating substituent on the activity, when we quantify it, that is called QSAR. You have you you are quantifying it. How much effect it will give this substituent will give. That is defined as QSAR. This is up to the definition. Then comes, how, how do we carry out QSAR studies? How do we, uh, what are the procedures applied in, into, the, into the study? So, let me tell you. See, you, you can go through for a, to get an overview about QSAR, you can go through this part like QSAR and drug design. For that, QSAR, as I told you, this is part of LBDD, ligand based drug designing. We have already many drugs, but we want to improve it. Yane, we have some compounds and their biological activity. We have some known data, and with this data, we make some QSAR models and then we predict for new compounds having improved biological activity. How all this happens? So let's see here. Like we have a reported leads, as I told you here. For this leads, we have biological activity as well. Now, what we do, we calculate different descriptors for this reported lead or number of leads we can cal there are thousands of descriptors one of the free uh, website is e dragon you guys can google it and find it 
from the e dragon you can calculate number of descriptors and for each molecule actually this descriptors are calculated for each molecule whatever you have uh, for example you have 10 molecules you have 100 molecules molecules of series for example uh, my area is let's say quinazoline maybe from the literature i will get hundreds of quinazoline molecules with their with their uh, biological activity and for these hundred of molecules i can calculate 10000 uh, descriptors and then we developed a statistical relationship between this descriptor and the biological activity that statistical relationship is called qsar or 3d qsar what is the difference in qsar and 3d qsar if you are among the descriptors if you are uh, calculating steric descriptors you are uh, counting on steric descriptors as well along with electronic uh, descriptors then that is 3d qsr but if there is no uh, no accountability of spatial arrangements that's only qsr so there can be hundreds of descriptors can can calculate with uh, while using different softwares so biological activity descriptors and then statistical relationship okay that creates uh, that creates qsar model with these models of course there are there are certain points for a model to be successful there is a, there are some values you have to prepare a successful model and from that model you can prepare new series you can predict the activity of any any molecule you design and you can predict its activity based on that statistical model and that gives you the leads so this is a short short summary of qsar then comes structure based just a second just a second please i don't know how to how to hide these but there are protein structure i was talking about sbdd in sbdd we are working around around the structure of the protein that protein either you you prepare it through homology modeling or you get it through pgp or i mean you have already reported protein now in structure based drug design that protein when you download you have to identify the binding site what are the binding pockets or what are the active domain of that that pocket uh by, uh, through binding site identification uh, there can be a softwares like like q site there is a software which identifies the act active pockets inside the protein so the first uh, step is, is identifying the binding site number one uh, number two if somebody doesn't have that that the software or your your design can be like you can go inside you can you you have downloaded that protein and there must be a ligand if there is a ligand an active ligand already reported you can extract that that active ligand from the active pocket and you have identified that active pocket here you can talk your own molecule because that binding site is already identified this molecule was downloaded and it has a, a ligand uh, an active ligand you are extracting it out and trying to fit your molecule inside so that is called docking docking is basically fitting of your molecule inside the active pocket inside the active domain of any receptor ah uh, so when there is a new molecule it can be docked over here or when you have binding site identification 
you know how binding site is there what kind of residues are present inside inside the inside the active domain so here you can design or a scientist can design a new molecule based on the insight of the active domains what sort sort of residues are there that they will prefer to bind with suppose this is the this is the shape you need to prepare prepare a complementary molecule which can fit over there exactly so this is de novo designing you can design a molecule which which fulfills the requirement of an active pocket to bind with this is one approach now comes the docking in the docking not only small molecules can be docked but not only small molecules can be a drug but protein itself can be a drug there are various protein so these protein can be dogged into that protein as well of course small protein can be dogged into the into this big receptor as well so there are two types of docking ligand protein docking and protein protein docking this was all a short uh, introduction about structure based drug design uh and there are there are number of softwares the top citing software is autodoc autodoc is one of the the top cited software and this is free so a lot of people are doing nowadays molecular modeling studies with the help of autodoc and there are nowadays there are n number of of softwares available even some are are uh, web based softwares you no you, you do not need to download it you can upload your molecule you can you can uh, upload your protein and the process can be done on the on the server of the host ah <clears throat> now let's talk about the success stories this is for those people who do not who do not realize the worth of cat there are many drugs many reported drugs which paved the way of success while using cat some examples are amprenavir nalfenavir as you can see there are n number of of drugs they were designed by targeting their proteins their their receptors so this is the success stories and there are n number of drugs these are where these are few examples which are are well known drugs but there are many examples nowadays i was talking about success rate of cat uh as i told you in 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 the previous slides that the the uh success rate is very high with with cat in comparison to the traditional drug discovery approaches like you can see in traditional high throughput screening 400000 compounds were tested and 85 were featuring inhibition producing a hit rate of only 0.021% and there is virtual screening virtual screening manner virtual screening using cad computer aided drug design so that the database was 235000 co for, for commercially available compounds and that yielded 365 compounds 127 of which showed effective inhibition a hit, a, a hit rate of nearly 35% so you can compare the hit rate it is it is awesome it is quite successful uh the disadvantage you can say is there sometimes we get pseudo result as well but there can be n number of reasons for that so hit rate is is quite quite significant we cannot we cannot negate the role of computer aided drug design we cannot uh, we cannot deny from it nowadays uh cad and covid role of cad in the research of covid-19 like for example i today i was just going through 
uh, through PubMed and when I type COVID-19 and talking, see the number of results are 201. You know, let, let, me, let me tell you apart from this, being a, uh, the research for COVID-19 is not very easy. You cannot direct because testing against this virus is not easy. You need a, we need a very uh, a biosafety lab, completely biosafety lab, and which is not easy to be established by any institution. To only only top-notch uh, research organizations can can establish that lab. But here comes the significance. Here comes the opportunity for CAD. We as a medicinal chemist, we as a pharmacologist, uh, uh, having background, uh, research background in pharmacy, we can utilize this CAD and we can see the number of, of uh, research is 201 for talking. In the same way, when I, I researched COVID-19 in silico, the result was 240, which is nothing. There is still a lot of scope for molecular modeling studies into this because when you will type only COVID-19 into PubMed, it will it will give more than 30,000 results. More than 30,000 articles have been wrote on COVID-19. But see, in silico is not that much. Still, there is a lot of scope for computer aided drug designing uh, in, uh, in, into the COVID research for for their role. So. COVID is giving opportunity, sorry, CAD is giving opportunity for the research in uh, overcoming COVID as well. So it's, uh, the, there is no question that uh, 